quiet came over the room. That wasn't weird at all. All right. <laughs> um, so today uh, is the second of our boutique lectures and actually the third to last lecture. Um, so we've spent the last like four or five lectures, I think, on, on RL and, and learning. And today we're going to take um, a slightly different perspective. You know, we've been working on how to generate more short-term behavior from scratch. Uh, and today we're going to think more about uh, multi-step manipulation and long horizon planning um, uh, and, and work that is general. Um, and so to set the stage, I want to give a couple videos of examples kind of giving the, the motivation of like the type of behavior that we're interested in producing. Um, so like the kinds of things that I would like my robots to do, this is a very simplified kitchen example. Here a green block is supposed to be food, just like believe with me. Um, and what we want our robots to do is it's, it's doing a, kind of what I'll argue is a complex series of uh, manipulation tasks. Um, you know, it's placing things, it's picking things, it's, it's sequencing the series of actions. Uh, it's making a lot of different choices based off geometry. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's doing all of that, that important motion planning stuff. And this is a video you all have seen before. Here again, we're doing multi-step manipulation and in addition to reasoning over kind of all of the motion constraints here, and we'll return back to this example, we're reasoning over uh, force constraints as well, and this is uh, to kind of uh, open the bottle. And the, the last example I'll give, I believe so far every robot we've seen has been bolted to a table. I don't think we've seen a robot move. Uh, but in the general sense, you know, we have robots that move around. And so you, you might imagine um, I have this robot that can move around and perceive the world. And in this case, the goal of the robot is to escape the lab. This is when we used to be on the fourth floor. And so it's doing this kind of complex series of manipulations that it's planning. Um, how do I escape the lab? Oh, there's chairs in the way. Oh, I need to pick up and, and move the chairs out of the way. Uh, I feel like often uh, professors are showing off their students' videos, and I have the joy of I am a student, and she's showing off the professor's video. This is work by uh, Leslie and Tomas. Like, they're actually coding in the background. Um, and at, at one point, you can see students come in and like, watch their advisors do work, which is fun. Um, so these are, like, I want my robot to do these kinds of things. I want my robot to cook. I want it to open bottles. I want it to escape the lab. Um, and you might imagine, you know, we've talked about composing high-level behavior before. If we go way back to lecture 10, we talked about you could script things, you could do behavior trees, decision trees, finite state machines. Um, but I think you all got a taste for how like complex finite state machines can blow up. And if we think about accomplishing any one of these tasks, like having to write out the finite state machine um, for what these robots do, gets kind of intractable pretty fast. Right? Um, so we want to do better, and that's kind of what motivates what we're talking about today. Um, which is task and motion planning, uh, which pretty much everyone abbreviates to t the word TAMP. So you're just going to hear the word TAMP over and over to get today. Um, and like the highest order bit is that TAMP is a computational mechanism for composing pieces. Uh, most of what we're going to talk about is planning, but towards the end, we'll show how you can kind of bring in all of the pieces and that TAMP overall is a framework. Um, so we're going to start off with a couple building blocks of like, what is background knowledge necessary? Oh, I told Danny I wouldn't use this part of the board. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> we're gonna go over some building blocks. Um, then we're gonna formalize. I'm gonna actually kind of go on a mini rant about like how I like to define TAMP. Um, talk about the algorithmic components. And then once we've had that established, I think to make things a little bit more concrete, we're gonna go through a case study example. We're gonna return to that bottle and think about like, if I wanted to actually code things up, how would I do it? Um, and then we're going to end by returning to this idea of a TAMP as a computational framework and show kind of a bunch of different examples of how you can put different pieces in. Uh, this is also a fun way for me to end by just showing you lots of videos of robots doing cool stuff. Um, any questions about where we're going today? Okay. Um, I will front that uh, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today has basis in this survey paper that our lab wrote last year. Um, so if you want to look into things further or get deep insight into how this uh, lecture was structured, I would very highly encourage you to look at our survey paper, which is only slightly self-promotional, um, uh, but it's, it's good work. Okay, 
So let's uh, dive into the building blocks. Um, so I would argue task and motion planning builds off of kind of three key areas in terms of where it pulls from. Um, it is perhaps not surprising that task and motion planning pulls from motion planning and task planning. Uh, and we're actually gonna go through those very quickly because you all are super experienced in motion planning uh, and you've seen task planning in lecture 10 and we're gonna spend a little bit more time on multimodal motion planning. Um, because this is a review, uh, in some parts, we go through it a little bit quicker and I'm gonna actually ask you all to do like half the work in terms of uh, answering things. Okay, so to walk through all of these, I'm gonna set up a concrete example and this is a, like a very, very simple uh, TAMP problem. Uh, let's say that we have our little yellow robot and um, we have a, the red disc is a pizza. Bear with me. Um, it's on a green plate and we have an oven, which is an orange box. You could think of it as a, a hot plate. Um, and our goal is that we want our robot to cook pizza. Like that is the task. And for right now, we'll say the robot cooks pizza if it moves the pizza uh, onto the hot plate. That is our very simple, about as simple as we can get task. Is that check out? Okay. Um, so let's, let's work through each of our three kind of building blocks. Um, so you all know motion planning, it's lectures 15 and 16. Um, and I'm gonna say in the most vanilla form that uh, motion planning is if we have a start configuration and a set of goal configurations, right? Even our most basic motion planners that give you like, right, the RRT from homework nine, um, that you're gonna find a path um, from your start to your goal such that you're collision free. I'm, at, I'm reintroducing a little bit of notation because it'll help us later. Um, okay, and so if, if I give you this RRT, uh, the question I will pose to you all is, uh, have we already solved the problem? Can, can the robot cook pizza if all I give you is an RRT? Okay, some people are shaking their heads, no. Why not? You can just shout out, you do not have to raise your hand. So Yang is arguing that um, you have two different, uh, that the, the problem changes if you enact with the state. Um, so it's an excellent point. Uh, what you cannot do uh, with motion planning kind of in its most basic sense is that you cannot capture changes in the world. And so right to Yang's point, you cannot capture the fact that now you are grasping that plate. Um, so that is gonna motivate that uh, in order to capture that kind of structure in the world, what we wanna what we use is multimodal motion planning. Uh, by the end of this, you will understand and like deeply appreciate the beauty of this figure. We will get there. Um, so what we want to do is that we need to introduce modal structure into the problem. This is where multimodal motion planning gets its name. What does modal structure mean? So let's say we have our scene from before, and we're going to describe this scene with something called a kinematic graph. And so a kinematic graph is going to represent the state of our world. It's gonna encode the dependencies. So the, oh, I'm not tall enough. Um, each of our nodes kind of corresponds to an object, right? So we have a, a nodes for our world and then uh, attached to our world is our table, attached to, on, on top of our table is our plate, on top of our plate is our pizza, right? Um, and the edges represent some level of dependencies, whether it's being supported by or rigidly attached. And we're gonna call what's represented by this that this is mode stigma, right? That, that what the, the state of the world as represented by this kinematic graph is mode sigma. And I would argue that within mode sigma, we can do motion planning, um, that we can control the state of our robot joints. Um, now, if we were to do motion planning, kind of plan for our, a new configuration Q, uh, would our kinematic graph change? If we, if, yeah, if we, just if we just do motion planning and we move, basically change our configuration queue, we move our robot. I'd argue no. Why? Uh, because the, I guess the relationship between all the objects in the scene and the people interacting them is that the objects between like, each other won't change. Yep. Um, there are no, no, no relationships between the objects change. That's exactly correct. Um, so let's say something happens in the world something mysterious, we'll get back to what it is. Something happens in the world and now I am holding, the robot is holding the plate. Same question, does the kinematic graph change in this case? Why? Anyone? The plate's no longer in the table. Right. So our kinematic graph changes such that um, our pizza is still supported by our plate, but our plate, uh, instead of being supported by a table, is now supported by our robot hand. Um, 
Now, and Yang actually alluded to this earlier, is that we can do motion planning within this new mode, this mode sigma prime, but it is a different motion planning problem. In this case, it's a constrained motion planning problem where you maybe have the constraint that like I want to keep my, um, you have like an orientation constraint and you want to keep your plate upright, which like we know how to do. Um, but that they are, they are both, you can do motion planning in both, but they are perhaps two different motion planning problems. Okay, now if we have mode sigma and we go to mode sigma prime, how do we go from one to the other? So transforming to one to the other is what's called a mode switch. It's also called a kinematic switch, and that's our, the instantaneous change in our kinematic graph. Um, in this case, what action is represented, what happened during our mode, our mode switch in this case? Yes. None of these are trick questions. Um, <laughs> um, so what our robot had to do in order to switch from not holding the plate to holding the plate is it had to hold the plate. Um, it had to grasp the plate and it switched modes. Um, and there's a, kind of a neat point in that in order to be able to switch from one mode to the other, it had to be in a particular configuration where it can grasp because that is a configuration where it can switch to being in that next mode. Okay? So if we take away our kinematic graphs, we can now understand one of my favorite figures of all time, um, which is that this is kind of the heart of multimodal motion planning, is that you're basically sequencing planning within modes, switching uh, to a new mode at an intersection point, and planning within different modes. And so if we connect that back um, to our example, right, we can do single mode motion planning where we do not change mode, but we change our configuration. You can imagine that as moving along that green manifold from one configuration to another until you plan for a point where you can switch, you have to find a point that's at the intersection of your two manifolds, that's your mode switch. Uh, instantaneously, we're dealing with discrete time, um, you're gonna not change configuration, but you're going to instantaneously change mode, uh, and then you can like go along your happy way in your new mode, doing more single mode motion planning. So to summarize, what the robot's doing here is it has to plan for a sequence of modes, it has to plan for single mode motion, and it has to plan for mode switches. Okay. So if we return to our question from before, but slightly modified, um, if I were to give you kind of a start configuration and a start mode, a goal configuration, a goal mode, and a, and a multimodal motion planner that does what we just described, uh, can you cook the pizza? Like, can the robot now accomplish the task? I wanna give everyone like 15 or 20 seconds to like really think this one through. If it can, why? If it can't, why not? Any thoughts? Yeah. Can you explain what you mean? Ah, uh, so we, uh, the assumption in normal, sorry, I should have mentioned this, is that we know the set of possible mode transitions. So we know how we can transition from one mode to another. Yeah. Seems like it should be possible, but it might be like fairly inefficient. That is exactly correct. So you can actually solve this problem with multimodal motion planning. Like this is enough. Our robot could go home. Uh, but it, uh, and this most basic form of multimodal motion planning is kind of going to do a brute force search. So it's going to be horribly inefficient. Uh, for actually, for this problem, this problem is like so simple enough that it'll, it'll be able to solve it. But like once we get to that, right, if we wanted the robot to be able to escape the lab, uh, then it's going to become quite a problem. Yeah? I don't know if this is relevant here, but uh, does, it, does it matter the fact that you can grasp the system like intersections infinitely number for different ways? Uh, or can you put those in different modes? This is like my favorite question. Um, so there are two multimodal motion planning papers and the second one deals exactly with what you're talking about. And so what it does is rather than having a mode for each grasp, which as you mentioned could be infinite, um, they formalize it as that you have a mode family and that there's a parameter for that family. So like the family is defined as like grasping that object and the parameter for that is what is your actual grasp. Yeah, the, it has the, what do you, wait, what do you mean by changing? Um, I guess I'm surprised that if, if, you, if you define a manifold as like, okay, this is the possible action given like a, a, a like let's say the, the ideal grasp. If your, if your grasp is off, off center, what kind of solution is there to manifold to be quite different? 
you would have a different manifold for each grasp. Um, and the, the, in picking the mode switch, it is picking up what grasp to do. The discrepancies of like it being a little bit off would be if you were trying to do like online replanning in a loop. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, oh dear, my bad. Um, so the question is, uh, could you deal with basically not sticking contact, is I think a way to summarize that. Um, normally in multimodal motion planning, the assumption is made is that you have sticking contact, um, but you can imagine because the representation is like you are doing a single mode motion planning that if your mode was, I do not have sticking contact, you would need a more complex planner to handle that, but you could. So, multimodal motion planning might not be efficient enough. This is where uh, what we're going to do to kind of uh, get around that is we're going to leverage the representational power that comes from task planning. Um, and I'm gonna go through this part a little bit faster because you all have seen this to an extent. Um, so uh, for the next few slides, we're gonna be in discrete world. Uh, so you might imagine we have a discrete set of states. You have some transition function that says what is your legal changes between states. Um, you have some start. Uh, state, some goal states, and your goal is to find a path uh, from start state to goal state uh, following your transitions, right? This is uh, kind of the normal setup in, uh, in, in task planning. Um, and you can imagine this as, as a graph um, where your nodes are your states and your uh, transition function just decides the, defines your possible, in this case, directed edges. Um, and so you could just kind of apply graph search if you want to solve this. Um, and so if we take this formalism and uh, we're gonna apply it to a version of our pizza problem, but I'm gonna switch to making everything discrete for a minute, uh, and uh, apologies for the uh, icons. Um, but let's imagine that we have some set of movable bodies, right? We have our robot got cuter, our pizza got prettier, um, and we have some discrete set of locations that we could be at. Um, if this is kind of the state of our world, there's a question of how do we define state and how do we define transitions? Um, and so for state, uh, we're gonna leverage an idea that is like critical but seems so obvious that it's sometimes difficult to understand how critical it is, and this is the idea called factoring, which is that I'm going to represent the state of the world um, by uh, different state variables, and then I'm going to compose that by taking the Cartesian product of it. That is to say, I'm, not, I'm, not gonna, I'm going to actually break down what the state is and say like, my robot is that uh, in this case, the plate, my pizza is at the box, my book is at the sofa, my pizza is not cooked, and my robot is not holding anything. And there are like, I think we did up math, like 600 possible states uh, that the robot, that the state of the world could be at, and by kind of factoring things down very nicely, you can represent that super sparsely. It's kind of very obvious, but super critical to being efficient. So we're gonna represent our states in this way. How are we gonna represent our transitions? And this is something you all have actually seen before. Um, so this is in lecture 10, if people recall, preconditions and effects. Does that vaguely ring a bell? Okay, uh, so preconditions, right, is what um, needs to be true about our states in order to take some action, and our effect is what are the changes in our state once we take that action. And so if we, uh, I wanna pick up an object at some location, um, the, we're gonna say that the robot has to be at that location, you have to not already be holding something, the object has to be at that location, um, and then the effect, once I've actually done the pick action, is that now the object is not at that location and I am holding the object, right? That is what it means to define our pick operator. Cool? And so you can imagine defining uh, a series of operators, um, move, move holding, pick, place, cook. In this case, cook is just going to be a discrete action of like being on the oven. Um, and so if our plan was that we wanted our pizza to be cooked, and our pizza to be at the plate. Does someone want to pretend to be a task planner for a minute and, and give a feasible plan? Yeah. Take the pizza out of the box, put it in the oven, wait, like cook the pizza, and then pick up the pizza, and then put it on the plate. Yes. You are an excellent task planner. Um, 
Okay, so that, that is that we can now kind of find a, a, a plan uh, for our task planning. Cool. Um, so that is kind of, that covers all of the preliminaries, all of the building blocks of that we have motion planning, multimodal motion planning, and task planning. And uh, with that, I can kind of give the definition of TAMP that I prefer, which is that TAMP is an extension of multimodal motion planning that leverages uh, the representational efficiency of task planning. Multimodal motion planning is appropriate is abbreviated as MMMP, uh, or you can just add arbitrary M's as you say it. Um, TAMP is an extension of multimodal motion planning that uses the compact representational strategies from task planning. So if we have our representations from task planning, and now we want to bring it into MMMP, we want to like bring it into our robot, the question is, what has to change? And I would argue there are two things that we now have to account for, and that is continuous parameters and constraints on those continuous parameters. What does that mean? So we have our pick action from before that we spent some time understanding. And now, if instead of being in a discrete world, you want it to be a real, real robot, what has to change? So now, instead of being I'm, I have an object and it's at a discrete location, now we're going to be dealing with continuous variables. And so in this case, we're going to have that we have some object a robot is at a configuration Q. Q is a continuous variable. Our object, instead of being at some discrete location, is now, uh, we can describe our object as being at a pose, right? Pick your favorite pose representation, uh, and that we have some grasp. And so we have a mix of dis possibly discrete and continuous parameters. So this makes it a hybrid problem. Additionally, we have some of the same preconditions and effects that we had before. Right? Uh, like we still, uh, in order to pick something up, we assume that our robot is not already holding something. Um, but now we have to have uh, constraints on our continuous parameters. For example, um, the, the grasp operator, sorry, Danny, I'm going to go horribly off screen, um, is that, um, and it's a constraint that our grasp G is a valid grasp on our object obj. Uh, and we have the constraint that our pose P uh, must be a stable pose for our object obj. Uh, and Ken is that we have some constraint that if our robot is at configuration Q uh, and our object is at, is at pose P, that that is a valid grasp G on our object. Questions about this? We've transformed, we've like transformed into now dealing with hybrid spaces. Kin is just a uh, grasp, it just is that a valid grasp on the object? And kin relates in the robot as well. So kin uh, is, uh, you notice that grasp is just is that a valid grasp on the object relative to the object versus kin is like, is uh, your robot in a position where it can now use that grasp? Okay? So we went through a little bit of detail for, for pick. Uh, you could do all of this for the same actions we described before, right? Now we have to deal with trajectories, we have to deal with poses and configurations, and there's continuous but also discrete because we have objects. Um, and so we have, we have this set of operators. So now, now we have uh, discrete and continuous operators. If we were to turn to our goal, like our goal is to cook the pizza, I would argue that a, a valid solution, right, uh, our, our, if we run our planner from before, a valid solution would be to move, pick up the pizza, move, holding it, place it, and, and cook it. And the difference here is that now, um, right, these are over, we have continuous parameters to deal with. It's that you move given a certain trajectory. Does that? Okay. There's a reason that I like putting the solution in front of you, 
Um, and that is because to me, it outlines um, kind of what are the two things that you need to solve for. So I would argue that if we uh, leveraging all of this, in order to find a solution like this, what we have to do is search over action sequences. So searching over action sequences like is, you know, what is the strategy that I'm using that I'm uh, here, the one that we find is move, pick, move, place, cook. And then the other thing that we have to do is solve for those continuous parameters. You know, if that is a strategy that I'm taking, uh, what are valid configurations and poses and grasps? And you know, you have the constraint that uh, the pose that the grasp that you pick at is going to be the grasp that you're move holding and that you're picking with. And so there's there's constraints uh, between the different actions. Does it make sense that the sorry, <laughs> HDSP is hybrid constraint satisfaction problem. We are hybrid because we have discrete and continuous parameters. And we're basically trying to find what is a set of variables that satisfies our constraints. So it's a constraint satisfaction problem. Yeah? Which hybrid parameters are considered during the search and which are considered during the execution? Yeah. So it's which parameters are considered during the search and which are considered during the HCSP. Uh, the exact ones may vary depending on uh, implementation. But in general, if it is a, um, the parameters of the, op of the actions are going to be what you have to find satisfying values for in the HCSP. And so in this case, it would be Q0, uh, right, all the trajectories, but also uh, A, in this case, object, right, uh, that, that's found over. You do not have access to those discrete symbols in the same way. So then how can you then set the path? How can you say cook is like? So you can uh, define the mode where being cooked is true, but you do not have this ability to describe um, this discrete notion of an object being cooked. You do not have access to that representation. That is what some of the, the representational power that we get. You would, uh, let's see, you could specify the mode in a set of valid configurations. You might not have to give the specific configuration. I see, so then it would be basically like you're trying to chain together these subsets of configurations. So the idea is if you, like, so you have a bunch of subsets and, you, and I guess the thing that the camp is doing is they're placing like, I guess, Which is why MMMP uh, often ends up doing like a brute force search. Okay, so they just randomly like sample the order of the subsets. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll get back to what TAMP does instead in like two minutes. Okay, good question. Um, which I'm probably not repeating. Um, so this is the mini rant that I promised. Um, my uh, preferred way to think about what is task in motion planning is that your goal is that you want to search over a set of action sequences and then you want to solve for those uh, resulting parameters, right? That you have these two components. Um, and the reason that I prefer that is that um, to me it gets at the heart of like what you actually need to do and gives a point towards like what algorithmically are going to be the components. Um, a lot of times people, uh, I understand why people do this. They explain task and motion planning as there's some high level, symbolic, discrete task planning, and then there's some low level, continuous motion planning, and you just like put them together. And uh, the more I work on TAMP, the more that like deeply frustrates me. Um, and the problem is that it's not entirely wrong, but the reason why I find it frustrating is that I don't think it's a helpful framing. right? Because it leads you to be like, what is a task? And what is high level versus low level? And like, what do you mean by symbolic? Like jokingly, Leslie uh, banned us from using the word symbolic when we were writing the, the TAMP survey. Because like, what does it mean anyway? Um, 
And I think it, like a lot of misconceptions people often have come from people thinking of it as these two like separate things, when actually what you need to do is you're finding a, uh, a strategy, a sequence of actions, and then you're finding the parameters for those actions. And you can't decompose like high level and low level because your continuous parameters have an impact on what strategy you're doing and they're kind of deeply intertwined. Um, so that is my, that uh, you cannot think of these as kind of two separate things. And although we pull from motion planning and task planning, it is not simply, TAMP is not simply gluing those two together, right? There's a, a lot more deeper going on. Okay. Thank you for listening to my rant. Um, okay, so the two components that we've outlined is that you have to search over action sequences and that you have to ha uh, solve uh, the constraint satisfaction problem. Uh, searching over action sequences, right, as we mentioned before, um, you can think of this as graph search and in the very simplest form, uh, you could actually frame searching over the set of possible action sequences as just A star search. Um, luckily, the AI planning community, uh, like this is their bread and butter and they've developed really awesome planners that take advantage of domain independent heuristics. If you've heard of something called fast forward or fast downward that are really great at doing this search. So Richard, this comes back to your point of like, we can now leverage all of the awesome planners from the AI planning community. Fortunately, they're not open source, but that's a whole other thing. Um, so that's how we're gonna deal with searching over action sequences. For searching over hybrid, uh, for solving constraint satisfaction problems, um, it's actually a similar story to the one we told in motion planning, which is that um, some people do it with sampling base and some people do it with optimization, uh, and there are pros and cons between them. Um, but I don't think we're, uh, we can talk about that if we have extra time, uh, but the idea is that there are different uh, ways that you can uh, solve for, for constraining these values. Okay, questions? Okay, these are our two components. Uh, what we actually did, if I, if I go back to our survey paper, um, is that you can actually group most of the state of the art uh, TAMP methodologies um, by how they order these components. And so there's some category that primarily um, they first focus on, I wanna, uh, generate possible values that could be uh, satisfying values for my constraint satisfaction, and then I'm going to use those values to try to find possible action sequences, and if I can't do that, I'm going to, to repeat. That's like I'm going to try to satisfy my constraints and then sequence them into a valid uh, plan. Uh, FFROB, uh, which is work done by my lab mate is a good example of this. On the other end of the spectrum, you can imagine, first I'm going to try to find my action sequences, and then once I have my action sequences, I'm going to try to find satisfying values for those constraints. And a great example of a work that does basically this, uh, but using optimization, uh, is Mark Toussaint's planner that he published a couple years back. Those are two ends of the spectrum. It will perhaps not surprise you that the majority of work uh, is people who do interleave, that you kind of more tightly couple uh, searching over action sequences and solving for your hybrid constraint satisfaction problems. So we're gonna look at, exa at one example to go into like a little bit more detail of how this actually ends up working out. Um, and specifically, again, this is work done by uh, my lab mate, uh, which is this planner called Piddle Stream. We're gonna, we're gonna understand it, it graphically at a, at a somewhat high level. Um, so what Piddle Stream does, and again, this is a planner for solving TAMP problems, um, is that it's gonna take in a domain and you have a series of what's called streams. This is why it's called the diddle stream. Um, and those streams basically work to sample possible values. So this is handling the solving the CSP. Uh, we are sampling possible values. So that might mean I am sampling possible graphs, I am sampling possible poses, possible trajectories, possible wrenches all my possible values, once I have that set of, of variables that I've sampled, I'm gonna take my operators, start state and a goal state, um, and I'm going to uh, search over my action sequences. In this case, we're gonna use uh, something from the AI planning community, in the specific case, fast downward, um, and it's going to search over possible action sequences using those sampled values from our streams. If it can find something, it's going to use that information to kind of sample for more values. And it's going to keep doing that until we find a possible plan. Now, one way to think about this is that uh, if we think back to lecture 
16, we talked about PRMs. People remember PRMs? So PRMs, sample configurations, then they build that graph in configuration space and you search over for a plan. Piddle stream is the PRM of, of TAMP uh, and that you can think of it in that it is sampling values, again, which may be discrete and may be continuous. It's going to use that to build a Piddle plan, uh, sorry, Piddle search problem, uh, which is then searched through using an AI planner. Sample values, search, repeat. Does that check out? Okay, I think I'm going to skip over one part. Uh, there, not everything is perfect. There are computational issues. Uh, if we have time, we will come back to this at the very end. Um, okay, does uh, kind of the algorithmic components and then Padiddle stream as a specific example make sense to people? Are there questions so far? Yeah. That was the part I was going to skip. Saw it. <laughs> um, so the, the question for, uh, for guidance uh, for sampling in the shortest form, which you should go read the paper if you want to know more, or you should already know, um, is that um, it's basically going to use lazy instantiations, and so it's going to delay sampling uh, for as long as possible um, and use the information from the, the search in order to be more specific about how it picks those samples. Yes. Yes, I would say that because the representational uh, the representational power is what enables you to, to leverage that computational efficiency. But yes, that is correct. Okay. So what I want to do, we're kind of moving into the third segment, um, is that uh, to make this all a little bit concrete and kind of give you all a sense for like, if you had a problem and you wanted to apply task and motion planning to it, what would that concretely look like? Um, and kind of give you a flavor of what it is like to use those systems. Um, so we're going to return, and this is my bias, this is my work, um, we're going to return to an example that, I, that uh, we presented uh, earlier when we were dealing with the case study. If you all remember, this is when we were talking about um, impedance control and hybrid position control. Um, I introduced this problem, I'll, I'll reintroduce it here. Um, but you might imagine that uh, I, I want my robot to, to get me medicine when I am sick and old, uh, or either. Um, and so um, I want my robot to be able to open childproof bottles. I'll we'll argue that uh, specifically for push twist childproof bottles, what the robot needs to do in order to open it is that it has both pushed down on the cap while twisting. Um, and that if we are exerting this kind of wrench onto our object, we also have to fixture it in place. We have to hold it still. My goal is I, I want my robot to be able to push twist uh, uh, the lid and then be able to pull it off so that it can then, um, I don't know, give me my vitamins. Does the context for this, this problem make sense? We're going to spend the next, I don't know, 15 minutes with it. Okay. Um, so in thinking through, uh, there are, like, if I think about first about that, like, push twist operation, there are a lot of different ways that, uh, we could get our robot to do that. And so the way we kind of, we brainstormed up is that we, uh, we wrote out kind of four different ways you can imagine using the robot's hand or fingers in order to actually exert that push twist. I think we only talked about one of them in the context of the uh, control before. Um, the exact details of them are not terribly important at the moment, but you can imagine using your, uh, grasping it and twisting it or using your fingers or using what we call the palm of the robot or grasping and it could, it could pick up and use a tool. So these are like, a couple different ways that the robot could do that. Um, if we think about the fixturing side of things, like the robot has to hold the bottle still, um, there are a couple different ways that it could do that. Um, you know, you could get another robot to actually hold the bottle still. You could uh, put the, if you have a vice in your kitchen, which like maybe you do, um, the robot could put the, the bottle in a vice, um, or it could use frictional contact um, in order to kind of hold the bottle still. And so these are like um, 
the different components of like the different ways that I, I want to get my robot to do things. Um, from this, uh, we can think of is what is the set of operators concretely for our task, right? Before in our pizza example, we had pick, place, and move, and we do have those same examples because like moving, picking, and placing is is like almost always helpful. Like we almost always need our robots to move and pick and place things. Um, but then we're going to define a series of operators that are those like push twist actions. Um, Interestingly, for our, for our like fixturing methods, you don't actually have to like, some of this is just picking and placing, so you don't have to define new operators. All you have to do is um, define opening and closing the device, and then we're going to define a special operator, which is uh, removing the cap. Yeah? So we will define them. In this case, uh, we are also going to write the controller, uh, but later on we will show, uh, I'll show you a method that actually does learn the controllers. Can you repeat what the question Yes, sorry, the question was, uh, do you write down these controllers and then learn them? And the answer is you do write down uh, the operators. Whether you learn the controllers or you write them down uh, is kind of a design choice. But I promise we will get back to it. Okay. Um, so yeah, what you concretely do in this case is that, uh, right, what I did as, as the programmer is um, I wrote down this set of operators um, and the samplers that go with it. And so to make that a little bit more concrete, I'm gonna look at what does it mean to actually write one of these operators? Like if you had to think through for your problem, what does it mean to write an operator? Because we've only worked through pick and pick is kind of uh, one of the simpler ones. Okay. Um, so let's say that this, this action that we want to do, right, is that uh, the robot grasps the, the cap and it does this push twist. Um, uh, and if we recall, uh, what the actual, we talked about uh, in the previous case study is that the controller that's actually running to do that push twist is the impedance controller. So we actually know how to write down that impedance controller and we're just, we're not going to do any learning at this case. We're going to use the impedance controller we already wrote down. Okay. So. If right, I'm sitting in my computer and I want to define the operator, uh, I, uh, we're going to define it over what, like, what are the parameters to this action. In this case, I'm sorry, there are a lot of parameters. We'll kind of walk through each one. Um, but we have uh, the parameters. Some of these are continuous and some of these are discrete. A in this case stands for arm because I have two robots. And so one of the discrete things that the planner has to reason over is which robot arm do I use? Um, and then it has two objects, um, and it has poses for those objects, P0, P1, a relative pose between them, a grasp that it needs to choose, a wrench that it needs to decide to exert, and then it needs to decide what is the actual trajectory. Like these are, these are the parameters of our action. What are the preconditions? What needs to be true? Um, I also say that before uh, I showed that like a thing that needs to happen is that you need to define constraints, we're going to actually represent those constraints on the continuous parameters by shoving them inside our preconditions. And so we're only going to have preconditions and effects and not a separate kind of constraints. Does that make sense? Okay, so what are our preconditions, right? I'm a programmer, I'm sitting down. Uh, what I'm going to define is that um, our object that we're operating on has to be of type cap, and then the other one has to be of type bottle. This is because in this particular framework, I have specific things that are true about that object type, and so I want to um, give that object a particular type. Um, I'll then specify like a constraint that I want to have on my continuous parameters is that I want P0 to be the pose of the cap and P1 to be the pose of the bottle, and I have some relative pose uh, defined between them. Right? So these so far are kind of obvious constraints. Um, I want my robot to, to be at a certain starting configuration, Q0, and before I do all of this, I want uh, the hand of my robot arm to be empty because it needs to be able to kind of do this operation. Right? People following so far? I know we're getting a little bit into the weeds. Okay. Um, the next two things, um, first one is that I want my graph to be stable. Uh, now, I didn't do a mini lecture on mechanics. Um, so in this case, we just uh, say that this grasp is stable with respect to some wrench. Uh, honestly, if you want to know more details about like grasp stability and, and, and mechanics, um, 
come talk to me after. I love to talk about it. Um, but in this case, we're gonna, we, uh, we want a, a grasp such that our grasp is stable, and we want to make sure that our bottle is stabilized. And so that is that one of those things from before is true. Either another robot is holding our bottle, or our bottle is in our vise, or we have enough frictional contact in order to stabilize that bottle. And this is with respect to a given wrench. Wrench is a force and a torque. OK? Then comes kind of the biggest and most powerful sampler, um, which is that uh, we now want to define a relation over all of our objects. And this is the sampler that's actually going to generate the trajectory. And if we remember that this is the trajectory that is generating, is that it's generating that impedance controls parameters. Does that stop me if that doesn't make sense? Yeah, so what this is generating is it's going to take in um, you know, the object that is the cap and the bottle and those poses, and it's going to say, um, what is the motion that the robot has to achieve in order to, um, in this case, do uh, this twisting motion? So when we talked about the control parameters before, um, right? because it's impedance control, it's generating a series of set points and a, a series of stiffnesses for like, our, what are our impedances. And so what you can think of is that this is a sampler that basically takes in information about our current state and outputs what our robot should do, in this case, uh, Cartesian set points and impedances. Yeah? So where do you like encode the fact that how much uh, rotation it needs to have in between the grab your position and the cap? Right. So the question is, where do I actually encode what it means to do this motion? In this case, it's how much do I twist? Um, in this case, that is a predefined thing within the sampler, but you could also imagine that being a parameter. It could be yet another continuous parameter. Yeah. It takes in what is my robot, what are my objects, and where are those objects? And what is the wrench that I want to be exerting as I do that push twist? And it is going to return you the trajectory, which in this case is your Cartesian impedances and your set points. Okay, so those are the controlling parameters. The, the set points, the trajectory, right? Those are, those are the outputs of your sampler. Some of these are inputs and some of these are outputs. Oh. Because it is simply defining a relation over all of them. Yeah? Just like maybe a follow up. I'm, just, I'm still not understanding how you go from like the output there to a Boolean to the stable mode command. So this is, um, yeah, that's an excellent question. How do I go from, uh, you notice that there is an and on top, and so this is the precondition has to be true. And so what's happening here is that twist hand can is a uh, relation over all of these parameters, and connected to that relation is a sampler that is generating satisfying values of those parameters. And so basically, if the sampler is able to return values, then that uh, constraint is satisfied. If it can't return things, um, then there isn't satisfying solutions, so it isn't satisfied, and this thing would uh, render us false. Don't believe I understand your question. It, you just said that, that twist hand can return whether you can. It'll also return the trajectory. Okay. So what it does is it um, it returns whether it's true and it populates that variable t with the solution. Okay. And so that is actually just where the, the trajectory gets, gets stored. It is just enough to loosen the cap. There is another, there, we made the design choice that there is another operator which actually pops it off. Actually, the, the reason why we wanted to separate the twisting motion from the removing motion is because um, I gave that picture that there are four different ways that you could do the twisting. 
And so I want to separate twisting from, uh, from removing it. Um, otherwise, I'd have to kind of copy the, the removing it into all four of those. Good. OK. We're actually not done. Um, there's one other thing, which is that we want to check that our, our trajectory is collision free. Um, and then, so those are all of our preconditions. These are the things that need to be true. Um, and it's kind of, we built through together. Um, these are things that need to be true. And these are the, the, the variables uh, that we're basically solving for, uh, that, that satisfy these constraints. Um, in order to fully characterize this, we also have to define what is the effect of this action. And so the effect of our action, the main thing is that oh, we're going to say that the cap is now twisted off. Uh, and that we are not at the configuration that we started at, and we are now at the configuration that's basically at the end of our trajectory. Like our, our robot has moved as a result of this action. Effects are almost always easier to specify than preconditions. Okay. That is kind of a deep dive into like what is it like to actually specify one operator. Um, and so that hopefully gives you all a sense for what it is like to write these operators is that you write kind of what is the specification in terms of preconditions and effects, um, specifically for in this uh, framework in Padiddle, and then you write all of those samplers that actually does kind of the controller generation. Uh, in this case, we, we write it in Python. So now you, like, you've done that work, you've written all of your operators, um, we're going to tape our operators, and we're going to put it in Padilla stream, and we can now actually appreciate the video that I showed from before, which is that our, the goal of our robot, right, is that we want to uncap. So the robot is going to first do a uh, move, pick, and then place it in the vise. It's then going to do that, that push twist that we just spent a while discussing uh, before removing that cap. Right, so it uh, searched over to find that action sequence of move, pick, move, uh, place. Um, and it's solved for all of the continuous parameters. Uh, what are the trajectories? What are the paths? What are the actual configurations and the graphs? Yeah? It did. So the question is, did it have all of the operators possible? Did it, could it have picked it? Yes. In that case, it chose to do a grass twist. And the beautiful thing is that if I give my robot the list of operators, there are many, many different ways that it can solve the same task. I've learned I can't talk while this video is playing because everyone just watches the video. Just let it play. Right, that this way, I was asking it to do the same task. The environment was different in each, in each one in that the robot, uh, the bottle was in different starting locations and the objects were in different starting locations and in some cases there was the tool and in some cases there was a mat and there was only a vice in one of them and the robot is essentially saying, is doing the planning of like how do I sequence those set of actions to accomplish this task? And the really beautiful thing about this, um, right, is that it is searching over a space that is combinatorial, right? This is in, uh, showing not even all of the possibilities, but I put um, all of the possible push twists versus all of the possible fixturings. And the beautiful thing is, what I, what I love so much about this um, is, right, I told, I gave my robot, here is a list of operators. Here are the different things that you can do. And then it does the work to find all of the different possibilities. That it kind of does the combinatorial search to find how can I compose these operators uh, to find a satisfying plan to, to achieve my goal. Yeah? Um, is it possible to use, like, I mean, this approach at different levels? Like, I can imagine two situations. Like, one of the steps could be, like, you know, uncap another spin bottle, and then the next one could be, like, I don't know, do a bunch of other tasks in the world. Like, can you superimpose, like, multiple levels of this? Yeah. So, um, so the question is, uh, can you have hierarchy? Uh, and the answer is yes. And one of the most famous task in motion planners uh, is uh, hierarchical planning in the now. It is actually Leslie and Tomas's uh, task in motion planner is built upon this idea that if you want to do truly long horizon tasks, then you have to have notions of hierarchy. Uh, so yes, and a lot of people have thought about it. Yeah. Just as like a point of reference, how long does this planning process take in wall process? Um, you mean for like each individual one? 
Like, like if I wanted to find a, a plan. A plan, yeah. Um, so I have the results of that in the paper um, that this work is based off of. But if I, you want to do order of magnitude, um, sometimes under a minute or up to two, two to three minutes in this case. Um, part of that is because um, there, there, are, there are two, two reasons uh, why it takes. Well, I don't know whether you think a, a few minutes is a long time or not. Um, uh, but there are a few reasons. One is that I don't optimize any of my code for speed. And so it almost certainly could be faster. And I just don't care. Um, and, and the second is that um, there are actually, and this is something that's good, computational bottlenecks um, that can make this search difficult. Um, and that you can imagine, uh, right, if you were solving a constraint satisfaction problem and the space of satisfying solutions is rather small, then, and especially given that we, in this case, are taking a sampling-based approach, that it's going to take a while to sample satisfying solutions. Um, so sometimes I can set up this problem such that it's like, if, it, if I require exerting a lot of force, such that there are uh, only a few configurations that actually can achieve that, then I've basically made my constraint satisfaction problem very hard, and so the planner struggles and it takes longer. So um, this is hopefully a little bit of an example of what it is like to use uh, a task in motion planner. And in this case, um, although I, I did not emphasize it too terribly, um, this is a, a task in motion planner where, uh, instance where we are also bringing in kind of aspects of control, uh, right? Leveraging impedance control and different mechanics. I want to kind of expound upon that point. This is going to bring us to our last section about uh, TAMP as a computational framework. Um, and I want to hammer this home by showing, like, right, I've been showing mainly kinematic things uh, and taking a very planning based approach. And I want to kind of show you that a lot of the pieces that we've learned in this class so far fit within this framework and that you can integrate them in. And this kind of enables you to do uh, super awesome things. Uh, admittedly, this is also just going to be me showing off a lot of the work that our lab has done uh, because like nothing is more fun than bragging about your friends. Um, and so we're going to show a lot of videos of what kind of like awesome stuff that task and motion planning can do, um, which like maybe hopefully gets you excited about like things that you could do with task and motion planning. Okay. Um, a valid complaint you could make about what I've shown you so for, far is that there's no perception involved. Uh, and personally, in my work, uh, I do not deal with perception, uh, but that is not a limitation of task and motion planning. So we've had people in the lab who wanted to integrate um, perception in to task and motion planning. And so you have kind of your task and motion planner from before. Um, but instead of like a priori assuming you know where everything in the world is, which is what I do, um, is that we're actually going to use kind of all of the perception tools that, that we've learned throughout this class. In this case, they're going to take an image and operate on point clouds. Um, and in this work, they used a lot of pre-trained models and a lot of awesome stuff. We right, talked about mask RCNN in lecture nine, maybe? No one remembers. Um, right, um, that in this case, that instead of kind of operating on known poses and known objects, that your task in motion planner is operating on the output of these pre-trained perception models. And that allows you to do super cool stuff, like instead of having to have a notion of um, object state, what you can do is uh, I want to put everything in the uh, everything that's red in the red bowl and everything that is green in the green bowl. Uh, decides that bananas are green, which is I don't know what perception system did that, but the that's the decision you made. Um, and right here, it's putting all of the objects in the opposite color regions. Uh, and to like go into a little bit of detail, right? Um, the different perception elements that are getting used is that um, it is segmenting out the table, and then it's segmenting out all of the objects. In this case, for a lot of these, doing a color um, detection, uh, and it's kind of operating directly on those point clouds. Um, the other thing that it's doing is right uh, to specify its set of grasps is that it's using GBP, uh, which is a learning-based method. Uh, to kind of generate those graphs as opposed to those graphs being generated a priori. So this gets back a little bit to the question of like, are things learned? In this case, for this system, um, 
some elements are learned. For each of these, I'm going to have to say, if you want to learn more, I've listed the paper down below. Um, so this is just like kind of a little bit of a sampling. OK. There was a question before, um, which is, uh, right? you write out all of these things, and do you learn your controllers, or do you specify your controllers? Right? This was your question. Um, and in, for the case that I showed, we wrote down our controllers. Um, but like, maybe you don't want to write down controllers all day. Um, and so there was a project in the lab um, that was, what if we want to acquire new skills by actually assuming that we have the controller and we want to learn the parameters of our controller um, in order to use it? Let's make that a little bit more concrete. Um, let's say that the ta I would like my robot to learn how to pour. Um, and, what I, and I have some specification for what it's like to pour, and I want to learn how do I have to move my arm such that I can have a successful pour. And I do not want to have to write down this uh, controller from scratch. So what they did, uh, step one of learning is uh, we need to collect data. And oh man, I hope this video loads. So our robot needs to learn how to scoop. <laughs> How to, how to pour. Um, and so we're going to first collect a lot of data. I will point out that it is times 40x. Um, and we're going to have our robot collect a lot of data. Z is the lovely grad student running around in the background. Um, the nice thing about this is that what we're going to do is it's going to pour over and over again. And this is actually labeled data for whether the pour is successful, because you can measure that's actually a scale. It's what is the weight of the, of the amount that I've poured. And so you can imagine if the weight is very high, then I've had a successful pour, because most of those are chickpeas. Uh, most of the chickpeas win in the um, bowl. And if the weight is very low, then that's an unsuccessful pour. And so we ask our robot to do this over and over again. And we collect a lot of labeled data about what are the control parameters that lead to a successful pour. Does the data collection make sense? If you were worried about what happened during COVID, what, what did the stat of mice eat? They ate all of our chickpeas. Um, it was gross. Um, OK, so you have some grad student, in this case Z, um, collect a lot of data. right? And, it, and it's labeled training data, which is super awesome. Um, and what they did in this case is given the kind of specification of our action and given a lot of labeled data, what we're going to do is we're going to learn uh, a constraint which defines what are the valid control parameters that lead to a successful pour. In this case, they use a Gaussian process regression. Um, their argument, which again, they make more beautifully in the paper, is that this is useful for sampling and that it is great for data efficiency. And having watched the video from before, you might imagine why they really cared about data efficiency in this context. Right, so to summarize, they gathered a lot of data and they used learning method in order to characterize what are the control parameters that lead to a successful pour. I will say they use Gaussian process regression. This store, you could swap in kind of any learning method that you wanted to if you wanted to learn the control parameters, right? Um, but the nice thing is that, right, they, they gathered enough data, we like cleaned up the chickpeas, um, and that now our robot has effectively acquired a new skill and that it can now do pouring. There's nothing in the cup, the first pour, which I find like super weird, but there is stuff in the second pour, so we'll, we'll wait for the second pour. Um, we will notice it's, right, the goal is to pour, um, but because we've added a new skill, we haven't lost what we've had before. And so we still have all of, yeah, there it goes, pours. Um, right, is it still doing all of that geometric reasoning? I'll pause it for a minute. Right, we've added a new skill of like how to do pouring, but we haven't lost the fact that we know how to do pick and place, we know how to do all of these other things. We've just added something in into our existing kind of uh, repertoire of skills. Right? And once we've added in our skill, we can now search over action sequences that involve that new skill. And you can imagine maybe you use a different method, you learn a new skill, you add it in, now your robot has more capability, and you just keep building. Cool. This is one way to integrate learning, and there's, there's kind of a lot of different ways. The, the one other way um, that I'll mention that's just skipping um, is that uh, something that we talked about, that, that Charles asked about, um, is like, OK, you didn't ask why things are slow, but that's an interpretation of what your question could be. Um, 
is that uh, you can imagine also using learning to kind of speed up your search, that can we use uh, prior experience to speed up this search over action sequences? And there was some work done by our lab. Um, this again shows off uh, mobile robot manipulation and like the PR2 style of moving. Um, and now what this does is it actually, if you're searching over action sequences, it learns a Q function uh, in order to bias um, what action sequences you want to explore, right? We mentioned that you get comp uh, computational efficiency from task planning. The question is, what if I'm planning really long horizon stuff and I want to move even faster? Uh, and what they showed with this work is that you can basically learn this Q function that speeds up your planning uh, by a couple factors. Cool. Those are two ways to integrate learning. Those are not all of the, the, the possible ways, um, but I hope it gives you a flavor of kind of the ways uh, so far of like how you can integrate perception, how you can integrate control, and how you can integrate um, learning kind of into task and motion planning. Um, okay, there's one more thing that I wanna cover, and to be honest, I'm sneaking a special topic inside a special topic. Uh, um, something that we haven't talked about so far uh, that I'd be remiss if I didn't mention is uncertainty, right? If we think about what we've dealt with so far, we've kind of assumed that uh, the world is observable, that things are um, deterministic, that we know how the world is going to act, right? I wrote out those operators and I like, said, this is what's going to happen in the world. And it's making kind of a strong assumption that like, I know what's going to happen. Um, because like, the world is not deterministic, the world is not observable, the world is stochastic, the world is partially observable, whether the cabling is correct, the world is a POM DP. Um, so how, how can we get our, like, if we wanna use this framework, how can we have a framework that still deals with uncertainty? Uh, does the setup of like what we wanna do make sense? Okay, so I, I don't know if this was mentioned previously, um, but we're gonna introduce, instead of saying I know what the state of the world is, we're gonna introduce this notion of belief space. And instead of saying like the pose of the object is here, we're gonna have a probability distribution over your underlying world states. So instead of saying the, the object poses here, we're gonna say I have a probability distribution of like where my object could be, right? And what this means is I have a belief over where my object is. So the robot in now planning has to maintain what is its belief over where things are. And you might imagine, um, Right, that if I am a robot, I have some belief that my computer is on the table, uh, but maybe I do not know exactly where it is because I'm not facing it, and that if I use my perception system and I observe that I up, can update my belief on where I believe my, the pose of my computer to be. And so our system now needs to, instead of saying this is the state of our world and updating our state, we have a belief over our world, and we may need to take actions that allow us to update what is the belief of our world. And now instead of our effects being on state, our effects are going to be on our belief. Does that setup make sense? Now there's been a couple of different ways that people have done belief space planning. Um, this is perhaps one of the earlier ones. This is actually uh, the robot escaping the lab from earlier comes from this paper. Uh, but the example I specifically wanna show uh, is a bit more recent and actually uses that digital stream planner that we discussed from before. Um, so this is going to keep track of belief specifically using particle filter. If it doesn't mean anything to you, that is okay. It is a representation for how we're going to represent our belief. And what our robot's gonna do is I'm gonna kind of show this by example of that our robot's goal, our robot's goal is to cook spam. It's not for me, but it's cooking spam for someone. Um, and it doesn't know where sp the spam is at the beginning. And so what it starts off is that we say that the robot has a prior that there is a uniform distribution of where the spam could be on the table. It does not know initially where it is, it just knows that there's a uniform prior over positions on the table. And so what the robot decides to do is it says, well, the sugar box is in the way, and so I'm going to make a plan to pick up the sugar box to see if I can perceive the spam and update my belief on where the spam is. It's gonna pick up the, the sugar box, it does an observation, 
uh, it updates its, be its belief that the spam is not behind the sugar box. And so it says, okay, where else could it be? Maybe it's behind the Cheez-It box. This is the same Cheez-It box from the YCD object. Like everyone uses Cheez-It boxes. Um, and so it, it moves the Cheez-It box. Uh, actually, the first times it moves it, it still can't perceive that the spam is there, right? It cannot update its belief. And so it, it tries again and it actually moves it further away. And now it can finally perceive the spam, it updates its belief about where it believes the spam to be, and now it can cook the spam. It cooks the spam. Um, right, but what we saw is that the robot had some belief on where things were, and it had to do what's called information gathering actions in terms of like, well, I can't see it now, I should, this is a very weird set of videos to pause on. Um, and that's going to take information gathering actions in order to update its belief, in order to basically be sure of where things are before it acts. I want to emphasize that this is the same Padiddle stream planner that we had before, and it has basically um, a few extensions. One is that, right, instead of operating on states, it's going to be operating on belief. There's some notion of replanning, right, that as soon as you get an update about your belief, you have to replan and pick what is my new sequence of actions and new satisfying values based off that new belief. Um, and those are kind of the, the two key elements that we need to do in order to, to kind of enable belief space planning. I'll show one other video, um, just because it's super neat. Uh, we, our goal is that we want to have the spam in the bottom drawer, and we have a uniform distribution on where our spam could be. It could be either in the top drawer or the bottom drawer. Our goal is for the, the spam to be in the bottom drawer, and we do not know where it is initially, so what the robot does is it first opens the bottom drawer. Because if the spam were there, we would already be done. And so it observes, I will say in this case the, the camera is overhead, and so it observes, it says the spam is not there, therefore I update my belief because it was not in the top drawer, it must be in the bottom drawer. So I will go open the bottom drawer, I will observe, sure enough, my spam container is there. In this case it actually has to put the spam on the tabletop, um, in order to have its hand free so it can close the drawer, then it uses its open hand to open the bottom drawer, and now it can place the spam there and observe uh, that we've achieved our goal, which is that our spam is safely stored away in our bottom drawer. Yes? No, so there is actually two versions of this video. One is that it, it picks the, the top drawer first. Yeah, so Russ's, sorry, Russ's uh, question is, there's no optimization happening, so why would it pick the bottom drawer first? Um, and that actually gets to a point, like we've been talking about find, solving uh, constraint satisfaction problems, um, but in this case, all of the, what we've been talking about is finding satisfying values and not necessarily optimal values. Um, you can imagine having a constraint satisfaction solver that leverages optimization um, such that you actually do get optimal values. But in this case, it's not. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question is like, <laughs> the most general form of, of, uh, of phrasing Richard's question is like, why is all of this worth it? Um, and what does it buy you? Um, and so you could script this behavior. If I gave you this environment and I said, hey, I want you to, um, get the spam in the bottom drawer, and the spam is either in the top drawer or the bottom drawer, I have full belief that, okay, pun not intended, I, I, I think that you all um, could write a script where the robot does exactly that. Like, you could recreate this behavior. It'd be kind of a weird final product, but you could do it. If the environment changes at all, you have to re-script it out. Like, if I gave you a new robot, 
or if I gave you a different object, or if I said now there are three drawers, or now my probability distribution is that I believe uh, my prior is that the spam is on the tabletop, um, you would have to re-script out that behavior. Right, and so the generality that this gets is that I have defined each of my operators and that the task and motion planning element uh, composes that in order to solve my problem. And if I give you a new environment or new objects or new robot or uh, new settings, uh, you can still kind of throw all of this power at it. You do not need to re-script out robot trajectory, and then grasp, and then move, and then pick. The robot is doing that sequencing for you. Like, one of the reasons I love task motion planning is it allows me to be lazy. Uh, I do not want to have to tell my robot what to do. I want it to figure it out for itself. And when you're scripting, you're telling it, do this, and then this, and then this. Task and motion planning, it is figuring out what is my valid sequence of actions, given you've told me what I can do. Yeah, so the question is, uh, what if things are not deterministic and something changes midway? So the case study that we walked through with the, the bottle, it would absolutely be a problem because there's no replanning there. It plans everything ahead of time, and the robot basically closes its eyes and tries to do it. And so if you, as like a pesky human, like ran into the middle of my experiments, the robot would not know what to do. In this case, because it is perceiving and continuously updating its belief, um, it is doing replanning. It is replanning based off its belief, and so if you were to kind of walk in and like steal the spam, it would update its belief and replan accordingly. Okay, so we are exactly at time. Um, I'll just leave with um, this is the list of kind of all of the papers in about rough order of the things we covered. We actually didn't cover some uh, middle part of this, uh, but I think they're really cool. And so if you're kind of interested in exploring this more, again, highest priority probably goes to the survey paper, which kind of summarizes all of this. Uh, but these are kind of neat extensions of things you can do with task and motion planning. Um, yeah, but if there are no final questions, um, this has been the special topic on TAMP. Thanks, everybody.